My name is Chip. Uh, thanks for introduction. I'm here to talk about the LM sandwich. I know it's dinner time, so I just try to choose an appropriate picture. So it's 10 minutes. Oh, wait, how do we move? Uh, okay, slide. So um, it's 10 minutes, so we won't be able to go into anything too deep. Uh, but I believe that um, LM is not the everything. It's part of the, of the pipeline. So we want to talk about what happens before and after LM. So one thing is going to like um, celebrate a little bit. I do think that's like the popularity of LM made a lot of people realize a lot of things that the MOS community has been talking about for many years. So for one thing, like you can't do AI without data. And now I see a lot of companies at the wake of generative AI try to figure out the data story so that they can leverage that data to enable new use cases. And the second is that real time is good. I think for a long time we're talking about batch predictions, online predictions, and now with LM everything just happens in real time. It's pretty awesome. And of course another is a data distribution shift. So now we see LM and the enter ChatGPT is like, oh, our knowledge cutoff is in September 2021, so we can't help you answer with that. And we know that the world has changed a lot since 2021. And of course, the last one is that states matter because now we want to get to the context, history, like previous chat. And it's not like just one off request anymore, but we want to like le leverage history, historical information to make better predictions. Cool. So, agenda, very simple. Before LM, we have context learning. And after LM, we have execution and monitoring. So, context learning. Um, so, like a couple of questions. Like, for example, like when we ask, when we, so I, I asked a friend about, whether he thinks that context learning would be here to stay, because there are a lot of questions like whether prompt engineering is hacky or like how long we still need to do context constructions, context learning. And his response was that context learning would be relevant as long as human to human communication is relevant. And the reason is that like for a lot of questions, we need context to respond. So first of all, I ask you, what is the best Vietnamese restaurant in the country? And the context required would be which country, right? And if you ask into like the so ChatGPT today, it was assume that the country here is in, is the U.S. But in a lot of case, for many cases, the default context is not obvious, and you need to tell so AI what you want. Or another question could be, how many on booms has Taylor Swift released? So if you enter in ChatGPT, it might not contain like or any other AI. It might not contain all the new information on Taylor Swift. So you might need to enter the newer albums as part of the context so you can answer the uh, question correctly. So there are many use cases. Um, so you, I know that's like you are probably familiar with them. Um, so for some like customer support, like we call them like external chatbots, so chatbots that you can talk with the external users, but also into the chatbots. So like for example, the employees can talk and ask questions about the company, like, hey, I have need to do these vacations. What is the policy for like vacations? Or like, oh, does the policy cover that X Y Z? So like, there's a lot of like internal knowledge that you can use a chat to help the employees discover. Uh, I've got document processing, summarizations, uh, or like storytelling, or like any task involving a lot of genes and proteins. So in this, this like very interesting paper, um, they found out that like uh, for a specific academic data set, like 16% of the questions require context to respond. Uh, but of course, I would imagine that for industry, depending on the use case, that percentage can be a lot higher. And here's another, like you can see this, like uh, people talking about context length, because I choose to input context into your uh, into the prompt, it might take a lot of like input tokens. And here's an average for some of the tasks, it can go up to like hundreds of thousands of tokens, which also means that contact lens will be a key challenge for the future AI use cases. So here, Chatroom ML and the LM uh, workflow changes a little bit. So one thing is that like for Chatroom machine learning, you get a users using the applications and it might create a prediction request. And then you might also like tap in the internal data to get the feature extractions so that it can input into the model. So here the input into the model would be like features. So the model can make predictions. However, for LM, it's like almost like similar, but like there are two key differences. So one thing, the input into the model would be the prompt, which could contain the context. And if we need to construct the context from, uh, from like the data or like other historical conversations. And then um, it's not going to be one operation anymore. But like for each response, uh, you for each prompt, you would need to like pull previous conversations as well. So you can see this like after the LM, 
I'll put a response. It will go back into as part of the context for the next question. And I also think about like uh, I added the low latency data pipeline because for traditional ML, you might be able to do that in a batch space, but like for much for LM, everything is pretty much in real time, and um, you want to do things as fast as possible for the users. Um, so here's an example for the context needed for customer support. So here's a use case: it's an external uh, chatbot. So say I'm an user, and I want to like, change the shirt I ordered yesterday from site M to like L, right? And here on the left, you see like the kind of data that chatbot might need to be able to respond correctly. So first of all, the first thing it might need is like to get to pull out the customer identity. So you can respond like, hey, Sarah, let me look into this for you, right? So you need to know the, who you're talking to. And then you might need to look into this customer recent orders. So like, maybe that person never ordered the shirt. So you need to double check that to tell that like, maybe like if that person really ordered a shirt, uh, and you might want to confirm that with the, with the users. And then you want to check into the order status because if the order has already been shipped, then there's not, mu not much you can do about it. You can tell the users, like, okay, it has been shipped, so now you can return it and order one later. But if it has not been shipped, then maybe there's some room for you to do about this. And of course, you need to know inventory because like, maybe the site L is not available anymore, and you might want to recommend other items. Like, okay, I know that for this shirt, there's no size M. Would you, size L, could it be interesting like, as a shirt based on your preference in the past or like other users' preference? So like, there's a lot of information that you might want to pull on from your database to have the AI like respond to the users in real, uh, to the users effectively. And a lot of that would need to be pulled in real time because you probably don't want users to wait for like five minutes. Um, so connect data can come from multiple sources. Uh, so a lot of them, like uh, people talk about like vector databases a lot, uh, and it's definitely like going to be here to stay. And vector database is not something new, right? Like I think uh, it has been around for like many many years, for like almost a decade. Um, and like Google has scanned, um, Facebook has Fice, and they own very good vector databases. Um, so they're not new, uh, they've been around for a while, and I think they will continue to be very important. So they are really good for unstructured data. So you can chunk them and get embeddings and store them. But also need like, un like uh, you also need them for need data, need structured data as well. And you might want to access them from a transaction store and a streaming, or a streaming data like Kafka, Kinesis. Um, and it's like here's a low latency, but the latency requirement really depends on use case. And if you don't have a strict latency requirement, then there's a lot of room for you to design the data pipeline. For example, if the user is okay with like 10 seconds, then you might still have time to go into Snowflake or S3 to be able to query and retrieve the data. But if our latency is like a second or like 100 milliseconds, then you might need to like store everything in fast, uh, fast storage or like hot storage. Like you might need to go to like Redis or Cassandra or Postgres, which could also be very expensive. Um, and of course, there's a question of like security. So you need to make sure that um, the employees or like people who use a chatbot don't accidentally include personal or sensitive data in the context and send it like outside because it's be my violations of like compliance. So um, it's actually a very interesting thing. I'm not sure uh, how you guys, if, if you here have experiences, but I see that a lot of companies, a lot of managers I'm talking to are worried about their teams using LOM without reporting like how they're using LOM. So like I think like um, there's some crazy number. You can probably like look into research about it. But there's crazy number of people who have no idea how their employees are using LOM or just like copy and paste any document into like ChatGPT and see what responses get. Um, and it's really not kosher. Um, anyway, um, and also you might want to like detect and block. Um, on the request that might contain this information, so say that you might have some kind of like uh, check before you sending out the API request and say like, okay, does this contain like PII or personal or like sensitive data? And if so, like what could be the appropriate action to do that? Like do you want to block it or do you want to flag someone or like what, what, what action do you want to take there? Um, so I would say this like context learning is actually a data engineering problem because it deals with data retrieval, uh, data governance, and also like latency optimizations. Cool. So here uh, I want to plug like Claypot. We do like we we are we are a pretty much a data product. So um, we we deal with any time when people have latency or re data retrieval problems. That's where we are. Um, okay. So like uh, after LM, 
is going to be executions, and that also involves data. So let's say the chatbot has successfully updated the order from like site M to site L. Now someone had to execute it, right? Like it had to like alert the appropriate people like who is involved, so that maybe like the actual warehouse employee or some warehouse robot will actually do the task of like swapping out site M for site L. And of course, you want to much update on the databases. For example, you might want to update the auto data, databases, or you want to update the inventory database so that you can like maybe remove on site L and like add back on site M. Um, and after that, you might want to like monitor like LM responses. So I think like we, we uh, there's a lot of research today and like to try and understand the level of risks that LM pose to a business. So one thing is definitely like, called, like brand risk, um, uh, brand risk. So for example, like it might output like very racist or sexist content, or it's just like bath mouth your brand, or like bath mouth your competitors, which might not be a good look. Uh, and of course, you might want to detect like if maybe the LM might ex accidentally reveal. Um, sensitive or personal data. For example, there have been like a lot of people trying to jailbreak AI uh, LM to make it return like phone numbers, social security number, email addresses, or like other private information, which you might want to detect and block. And of course, like uh, you might want to like gather user feedback to improve the LM. And also, like um, a very big question I get a lot at, uh, when I go to talk to different companies is like what to do about hallucinations. Like what if so AI yeah, just make up stuff and just like and it's like a very challenging problem, uh, and I don't think it's like the concrete answer, and definitely not something we can re we can cover in like ten minutes. But anyway, uh, that's that's my talk. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the time, and feel free to reach out uh, if you have any questions. Here's my email, Twitter, LinkedIn, I'm, and also very ac active on Discord. All right, so we have a couple of minutes for one question for Chip. One question, if you have, you can raise your hand. Here you go. Um, so these most recent slides, are they going to be on your blog, or are uh, they in the book? It's not my blog, but I can send it to you. OK, cool. Yeah. cool. Thanks. Chip, thank you so much for everything. I'm sure thank everyone you. learned a lot. Give Chip a big applause.